Thanks to AwesomeX.com for sponsoring The Bridge with Kira. Supercharge your immunity with LB17 and the other fine products at AwesomeX.com. O-S-U-M-E-X dot com. Hello, Kira. Hi. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. How's the sound? The the sound is good. You don't have to do video um, with okay, me because we're just going to do sound. Um, I'm. I've picked, as I've said to the uh, listeners, I've picked the spot with the most background noise possible tonight. That's really good. Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> because it's super cold. Usually I do the show from my truck because I live in the woods and we don't have good internet out there. So I get on the road and I do um, the shows somewhere safe and warm besides my woods. Um, so thanks for joining me tonight. Um, no I haven't told I haven't told them anything about you, so I'm going to let you define you to the audience. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, how do you define something so complex in such a way that it's simple and easy to understand. Um, so my name's James. Um, I live in Birmingham, UK. I am 37 and I am a practitioner of a healing technique called the Havening Techniques, um, which I'd love to share with your listeners. Oh yeah, um, I, I am a, of a spiritual kind of personality. I, I like to investigate spiritual matters. I like to look at um, sacred sites, uh, ancient civilizations, and visit the places like Stonehenge, uh, Karnak, which is not far from here in France, in Brittany, um, and, and kind of get in touch with those, those ancient civilizations and what they were all about. Um, I, I enjoy... Um, the practicality of spirituality as well. I do tarot reading, um, and I find that, that that's kind of a, a good way to open up conversations with people and, and kind of find out stuff that wouldn't normally come out in just a across the table coffee conversation. Um, but yeah. So those are all things that I'm really interested in as well. I'm, I'm especially interested in the megalithic sites. Um, there are quite a few in America that a lot of people don't know about. Um, the, yeah, was, the mounds. Looking, um, I think we're, we're not far from you, near the, the, the West Virginia Penitentiary, there's a, there's a, a place called uh, the Grave Valley Mounds, or something, Moundsville. Uh-huh, yeah. Of, uh huh, yeah. The burial mounds. What I find fascinating about it is that in England, not far from Stonehenge, we have a, a hill called Silbury Hill. And to look at these two mounds separated by 3,000 miles of water are very, very similar. And I find it fascinating that people on opposite sides of the ocean are, are building the same kind of monuments at the same time in history. Um, 
I don't know what your thoughts are on that. But I think that there is a fucking well, global. Yeah, I mean, and by hand as well. I mean, yeah, but by hand, and it took generation after generation after generation of people to build that. Not not just you know we got it done in you know a year or a few years, but generations of people by hand. That that's some really uh, that's something really important to spend that kind of energy and time doing it. The other thing about it is the precision with which these monuments are put together. A lot of them are lined up with the, with the summer solstice, the equinoxes. And when I say lined up, I mean lined up with the precision of a Swiss watchmaker. They have a, um, a few burial mounds uh, near um, Stonehenge where only on a specific day will a shaft of light enter that tomb and reach all the way to the back wall. And that will be the, the winter solstice morning or the, the rise of the summer solstice sun. And it, it takes a lot to build a building with stones that weigh in excess of 20 tonnes sometimes and line it up to an event that happens once a year. You know, intergenerationally, these guys really knew how to build these these monuments and they were doing it like you say by hand using antlers from deer um, and digging up huge amounts you know huge volumes of earth and carrying it with their bare hands to build these monuments which are still here today three four five thousand years later um, it's amazing you, you know it, it beggars belief um, I've been looking into these sites for quite a while I've been to Stonehenge and and that's quite an experience if you're ever over in the UK here, I recommend going down to Stonehenge only on a solstice or an equinox because um, those are the kind of times when you can get in for free. You can watch the sunrise, the druids are there doing their rituals. It's an amazing experience. Um, um, I have been there. I went there um, in ni 1989 on the uh, winter solstice. Mm. Yeah, goosebumps, baby. So <laughs> that is brutal on the uh, winter solstice. <laughs> I've never seen rain moving so horizontally. It was it was just windy, rainy, and cold. So I, I admire your courage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Spiritually, that's an ordeal. Um, but yeah, I mean, summer solstice uh, a couple of years ago was attended by forty-seven thousand people, um, and I mean that. That's not an organised event. That's 47,000 individuals who make their way down to Wiltshire in England and are just there to watch the sunrise. You know, this, this, this universal experience which we all share, watching the sunrise. On that day, at that place, 47,000 people joining in in a communal experience. And, I mean, if anything, the, the, the legacy that these sites have left us is that mysterious kind of combined experience that we get when when you go down there you meet people who've come from all over the world to watch the same thing that you have and the characters that you meet and the interesting people you know the, the legacy of these sites is that we get to meet people from all around the world who share just a little bit of commonality with us and and it's it starts interesting conversations you meet lifelong friends it's an amazing thing and even you know ignoring all the archaeology ignoring all the history just for that these monuments have a, a really special place for me just the, the connection to other people some of those those conversations are really about um the origins of human beings and why we're here and all of those really um exciting questions that um more interesting people i think like to ask well, I mean, who built them? Was it was it human beings? Was it another race of human beings? Was it giants? Um, there's so many ideas, so many things, and you know, you you end up many times with more questions than you do answers. But I'd, I've looked at it from a from a religious text point of view. I've looked at the history of it, um, what the the possible chances are that it could have been aliens. I'm not so sold on aliens, if I'm honest. I, I think that it would probably was either humans or a species of human, but it's it, it invites the debate and it gets people going. You know the, the the pyramids, the the incredible complexity of their position on the planet, the 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 
units of measurement that are built into the, the structure are just beyond the technology of the people of the day and you know it, it asks so many questions of, of our history of our our knowledge of the past the um influence of agenda on the present moment and and what we're allowed to understand about these monuments what we're told about these monuments um it's really interesting it's a fascinating topic um i i'm pretty f firmly on the on the side of i think that uh, it was humans. <laughs> I think that um, they stand as a reminder of, of how great humans can be. And it also is a reminder that um, our concept of, uh, throughout time, uh, us evolving and becoming better, it might, might be a little story that we've been told or that we tell ourselves. Because, um, you know... It, that that makes us uh, reliant on our concept of time as well, being linear, um, which is probably not not a fact either. So those two things are pretty tied in there. Yeah, time. Time is an interesting topic as well. Um, Giza and the Giza pyramids make a fantastic prime meridian. Um, when, whenever you have time in any any kind of context, you have to have a point. Well, uh, currently we use Greenwich, so the Egyptians were using Giza and specifically the Great Pyramid as, as their prime meridian. It, it's on a point which covers the most land mass in in each direction. It was perfectly lined up north and south, and and it was their kind of time prime meridian. So whereas you guys are in the states, you're you're on well the afternoon now this is the evening here in the uk so our prime meridian is greenwich theirs was giza and the control of time is a fascinating topic you know you know the saying time is money if you think about time and the control of time who says where time is where where the prime meridian, meridians are who controls that the the global markets operate on time all of the, the currency exchanges all of the stock markets everything has uh, a specific time a time of day that markets open markets closed and and the the topic of controlling time is not spoken about when when you look into <clears throat> geopolitics and and how the world is run time is a vital ingredient um napoleon said that he won all his battles because he understood the value of five minutes now today we have trading floors that are building their their bases near to an exchange so that they can get an extra microsecond um between you know the the, the exchange of a a million dollars worth of gold or or something like that so so napoleon's five minutes is now down to microseconds or fractions of microseconds and I think that this, this topic of time and how it relates to our day-to-day -day lives is important in understanding how these sites were constructed, why they were constructed, where they were constructed. It, it's all geared into that, that kind of element of knowing that moment when the sun rises on the horizon. That's a point in time where you can kind of say from here on, we know that there was this, this you know, we've got this anchor or this hook that we can place time on. And we know that at a specific time each year, that sun's going to break the horizon. Um, even even our language, words like horizon stems from Egypt. Horizon, Horus, Horus would go um, into the underworld. He would rise in the morning. So you've got that horizon. Um, so it's been passed down to us through language. Um, we've also got hours. Hours, Horus comes from uh, hours. The, uh, the etymology of the words. Um, so this this whole concept of time, money, where these structures are is all kind of tied in together in an interesting matrix of, of um, information and, and how we, we run our lives. Well, when I was, um, when I was a bit younger, probably about 20, 22 years old, I had a horrific accident. Um, I, I came home to my house just as it was being burgled. If you if you can imagine, the timing on this was spectacular. I came into the house just as the burglars were exiting. Um, and I ended up with a, a really bad break to my leg as I, as I jostled with these guys. 
and um, it kind of precipitated a sort of winding up of my life. Um, my relationship ended, my career changed, I, I, I didn't have any money, and I found myself having spiritual levels of pain. I mean, really, really interesting stuff, emotional, um, physical pain, um, uh, social pain, because uh, my, my friends... Uh, my friend circle was unsupportive of me at the time, so I ended up having to completely shift my social circles, um, and it, it led to me doing a lot of soul searching. Um, I, I suffered a bit of post-traumatic stress from it because um, I, I was in a vulnerable place at the time. My father had just passed away, and you know a lot of stuff happened in a very short period of time, and. I, I received an in, a small inheritance from my father and I decided to use it going traveling. So I, I went, I investigated these sacred sites. I stayed with some fascinating people. Um, and I, I kind of made the decision that I should kind of heal myself. And I was looking for techniques and ways to, to deal with what I was going through at the time. Um, and that, that kind of led to some, some dead ends. I, I did some, uh, investigating into hypnosis and uh, neuro-linguistic programming and, and some of the, the more kind of uh, up-to-date techniques that were around at the time. We're talking 12 years ago. Um, and then I happened across a thing called Havening. Um, I was at a conference in London and Paul McKenna, I don't know if you guys know him over there, but he's a famous TV hypnotist over here, a success guru, an author, he um he's been around since he was a radio dj you know 20 25 years ago and now he's uh, a hypnotist uh, a very successful trainer he does um sort of psychological coaching for top athletes and he's he's a very very successful man in his own right he was doing a seminar and just as 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 a short interlude in the seminar he said I'd like to introduce these techniques. And he asked the audience of maybe a thousand people, is anybody in here carrying some stuff that makes them really messed up? I mean, he, he said he, he needs someone who's really struggling. And I was thinking of putting my hand up. I was thinking, you know, I've kind of worked on some of my stuff. I'll see who else volunteers. And this woman put her hand up and she's gone up to the front. And what I watched was amazing. It was it was quite simple what he was doing. He, he just appeared to be stroking her arms, stroking her hands, talking her through some exercises. But as he went, this, this woman's energy just changed. The best way I can describe it, when she walked up on stage, she looked very pale, very grey, very washed out. And she told her story and you could, you could understand where she was coming from. But during the course of this, this sort of, thing that Paul was doing the color came back on all of a sudden she wasn't carrying that weight anymore you could see that it had lifted and he asked her he said has it gone and for a moment she was just stunned she was like looking around the room for this pain and it was quite astonishing so when I got back home from this uh, training I, I Decided to Google, you know, Havening. I got in touch with the, with the uh, organizers, found out a bit more about it. Havening is basically uh, using touch to heal. Um, sensory information going through to the brain, and it creates uh, what's, what's called an electroceutical effect. So you've got pharmaceuticals, and we know all about them, drugs, big pharma, all that kind of stuff. But now you've got electroceutical, using electricity and electronic waves to cause healing. So rather than um, talk therapies, which which involve you know long drawn out sessions where you, you you talk to the person and you try and change how they think about events in their life, this uses the modality of touch to cause a biological change in the human in in their brain on a cellular level, and it's kind of like self therapy because the brain's functioning in a different way. It thinks about things in a different way. The, the information passes through different channels and people can be relieved of stuff that they've carried around for ages and they've tried other things and it just lifts. And it's an amazing thing to see. Um, I got home, I Googled it, I found out about the guy who created the techniques. He's a guy called Dr. Ronald Rudin. 
Um, he has an internal medicine practice in New York. He's, he's developed these techniques from a very Western medical point of view. Um, with these kind of things, these experimental kind of alternative therapies, there's an energy element to it. Um, but it's not like, uh, say, compare it to Reiki. It's not energy as in I'm putting my energy into you. It's energy in that when you stimulate certain nerves on the skin, that sends an electrical, electrochemical impulse to the brain. And that is the energy which is used in Havening to heal. Um, Dr. Rudin was in a TV special at Christmas. I don't know if you remember seeing it. It was uh, David Blaine was doing a magic trick where he pushed a, an ice pick through his hand and it came all the way through and there was no blood. Dr. Rudin was the doctor who was investigating this to see that it, number one, went well and he didn't sever a nerve, but also that, that it was real and genuine. Um, and he's got that kind of credibility inside the medical profession. Now, these techniques that he's developed, um, he's, he's formed a, a practitioner course around it so that he can train people to take Havening to the world and spread the, the knowledge of these techniques to as wide an audience as possible. That sounds wonderful. It's amazing. Um, it's extremely effective for trauma-related um, problems. So, so people who've got things like uh, uh, post-traumatic stress, um, somatic pain. Uh, there may be there may be incidences where they've got pains in different parts of their body, and it's not responding to painkillers. It's not responding to drugs. Um, havening can help rewind and see whether there's been a trauma and the pain is locked into the body through a trauma. Um, panic attacks, panic disorders, um, all manner of, of anxiety disorders are, are massively helped if um, it's encoded in the brain, you know, through a trauma. Um, and it can help, you know, kind of depotentiate your amygdala, um, which triggers those responses. But it's done using science and using medical science, not using woo-woo or voodoo or, or energy. It's actual empirical facts. Um, and, and it's a fascinating thing. And there's so much trauma, um, not only individually, uh, but on a societal level, on a global level. There's lots of trauma to heal. There's, there's no shortage of trauma to heal. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, like you've brought up an important thing there about societal trauma. Um, I, <laughs> I had a funny incident with Dr. Rudin. I was asked when he visited the UK to be his taxi driver. And uh, because I had him in the car, I thought, you know what, I'm not going to get another opportunity. I'm going to interview him. So I sat in the car with him and we talked about life, about havening, about what his plans were. And the, the topic of conversation led on to the Holocaust of the Native American Indians. Um, and he was saying about how um, the, the societal problems from the trauma land, losing their history, losing, you know, the, the problems with alcohol, problems with drugs, all of the social problems they face. This is, is inherited trauma, which has been passed down through generations. And he was saying that he wanted to find a way of applying havening to a, a whole society to try and um, deconstruct that trauma and, and allow them to move on in a much more positive way, which doesn't have these these holdbacks um, from the history. Yeah, and, and there's also the, the ripple of that trauma and uh, that ripples through not only the, the group that's traumatized, like American Indians in America, but for everybody else. Um, yeah, well, I mean, consciousness is universal, isn't it? Yeah. I think, I think that there's no bit of this planet that can be suffering trauma where it's not felt somewhere by someone else. So I'm keenly aware of the situation in Gaza. I'm keenly aware of the situation in uh, Syria. I can feel almost, if I, if I kind of think about the, the global context, I can almost feel the trauma, the historical trauma of the Native American Indians. There was 300 million people. That's a, a mind-boggling number, an insane number of people, you know, as... as 
the history played out in it, it and and it, it's not mentioned in the media it's not spoken about openly by by you know um uh, some of the the more soap opera type things that we see in our culture they don't they don't bring the topic up they don't talk about it it is just silenced and it leads to um people looking at them and saying well you know their situation is their fault and and applying blame on it to them when you know th- this is a, a a historical thing that's happened and and yes it's a they're all minimizing techniques so that um they don't have to deal with them so yeah they just sort of minimize it or don't and then the and then the basic ignorance uh there's there's really basically nothing taught in american schools about american indians and the, what is taught is uh, is a myth which is the myth of thanksgiving um and it's known to be a myth but we still teach it to our kids um I'm also aware of Hollywood and the way that um, it's propagandized us for years about cowboys and Indians. And, and it was always kind of like the cowboys were the good guys. <laughs> and the Indians were always, you know, they, was, they were always doing raids or they were doing this and that. But there's no kind of context of the culture that was decimated. The, these people who were building these mounds and who were, who were plugged into that megalithic, monolithic culture... Um, were completely obliterated and any knowledge they had, any culture they had was destroyed in a systematic and consistent way to the point where it's still going on today. Um, right. Yeah, it was quite sad. Yeah. Um, it's worldwide as well. It happens in Australia as well. The Aborigines of Australia. You won't see them in any of the Australian media that comes out. That you, You'll hardly hear them talked about. And yet these people were astonishing. I spent some time with the Aborigines in the Northern Territory and uh, they would make tools out of the environment. They lived there for 60,000 years and they'd make tools out of the environment and they'd use them and they didn't leave a mark on the landscape. It, it's utterly astonishing that these people lived like that. And yet we went in there and called them savages and said they weren't even human up until recently. Um, it's insane and it's evil and I can't and there's a there's no part of me that can understand that mentality but it, it's here I suppose we've got to we've got to live with it but yeah I mean I I think that it's um, kind of more like an illness or an infection um, of some sort and that you know it's an infection that that took over basically took over Europe before it took over America yeah, and well, so the, the Australian Aborigines refer to it as a, um, a mutant consciousness. They they call us mutants because we're we're not we're not living in that that groove where we're at one with our environment and the food we eat is natural. And um, I mean, it is part of our culture in a way. Um, it, it, when they say God made man from the earth, he wasn't lying. The, the earth around you feeds the vegetables which you eat. You know that that you need a plot of land that's organic and has bees on it and has vegetables on it and has a, a small amount of livestock on it and fish and clean water for for you to live as a complete human being. But they've replaced that with you need money and you need pharmaceuticals and you need pills and vitamins and tablets and and it's it's a a much smaller version of the truth that we've been sold. Than, than what's actually true about us. I, I think we, we are capable of so much more, um, especially some of the things that I've seen with regards to the neuroscience with, with havening. I've been studying what the brain can do, uh, the, the, the neural plasticity that's in there. We are fascinating beings if we're allowed to live how we're supposed to. Here's an interesting thing. The tips of your fingers wrinkle when you put them in water. They prune and a lot of people think, well, it's because we're in warm water or cold water or whatever. But your fingers prune because your brain tells them to prune. It's a signal from your brain to improve your grip and sensitivity of your fingers underwater. What kind of a creature are we that we can change the shape of our skin to suit our environment in moments? Uh, it, we're amazing creatures. Our brains are the 
the single most complex structure in the known universe, trillions of synaptic connections, and it moves and it's alive and it changes to suit what we're what we're doing. There's this this uh, thing about neurons that fire together, wire together, um, and as we practice a behaviour, it becomes more hardwired into us, and bits of our brain grow to 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 deal with that. So, for example, in London, we've got black cabs and black cabs will um, drive around and, and they've, they've got to do a test called the knowledge. And that knowledge test means learning tens of thousands of streets and routes. And it's, it's, it takes people four years to study, to learn the knowledge so that they can become a black cab. Now, they've done studies on black cabs brains the driver's brains before doing the knowledge and after the knowledge. And they've shown that the brain actually grows as they're learning the knowledge, as they're forming all these new memories and new routes and new pathways in their mind. Their brains are actually growing to deal with this extra information. And this is a concept that doesn't just apply to routes. It can apply to our behavior. Um, There are studies on um, people who've lost their sight where they've put on a backpack and on the inside layer of the backpack, the bit that's up against your back, there's almost a dot matrix screen of pins. And this backpack would have a camera on it. And as the person walked around, this camera would use this dot matrix screen against the back to project a very simple image onto the back of the person wearing the backpack. And after a short period of time, the bits of your brain that deal with vision learn that the that the pressing into your back of these pins relates to the environment and the person wearing the backpack can see based on the touches on their skin from this backpack your brain will learn to deal with your environment as it goes you know it's an incredibly powerful machine um and and some of the stuff i've learned since practicing havening about the brain is just fascinating it's an amazing organ. Let's go back a little bit to, um, to our concept of time, since we've gotten into the brain and into consciousness here. So our concept of time is worthy of looking into, but also our concept of space, too, is really connected to that and how we travel through space. So yeah, the thing that I was thinking about before our contact was, was the yuga cycles, um, the the idea that, that when these um, sacred sites were placed down, we were living in a golden age. Um, and it's written about in the Vedas and some of the Vedic stuff. And as we've kind of moved through these cycles, we've moved into a, an age of darkness. And the pivot point for this, leaving the age of darkness and going back into the age of light was December 21st, 2012. So we're technically, we're moving back now. We're actually making the return journey to to a golden age. Um, So this this kind of cyclical, um, geo-historical return to a golden age would be very interesting. I think we should should be kind of looking into what that implies for our civilization, you know, as as we look to evolve time and space as a concept are kind of they're kind of linked together even scientists call call it space time don't they they don't say it's time and space time is affected by gravity it's affected by a speed as well you know all kinds of it's very weird actually if you think time if you go too deep into it um a second for you is not the same as a second for me nor is a minute and and then there's the experience of time When, when you're having a good time time goes really fast and then when you've got like a dental appointment or something like that, you're not looking forward to time drags out and, and goes long. And, and it's, it's not a constant. It can't, well, how can it be constant? It's, it's more of a flux or a, um, a, 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 net, a matrix or a network of, of things rather than what we've thought of as linearly, you know, one second follows another second follows another second. I think we, we have to kind of throw out those assumptions and work on a whole new spongy time model where, where space and gravity and speed are all kind of taken into account. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, recently there was, you know, that discovery of gravitational waves that were detected and confirmed Einstein's theory that this kind of may play a role in changing 
our, our concept of space and time. Um, I think probably humanity is only beginning to really understand some of these uh, discoveries. But at the same time, I think that discoveries like this are, are rediscoveries uh, and go back to what we probably already knew as humans um, at that time when we were making these mo monolithic or megalithic sites. Yeah, and, and there's something within us that recognizes these, uh, these sites as sacred or as bigger than ourselves and bigger than our generation or our, t you know, our time, where we are at. <laughs> um, when, when I visited Stonehenge, it, it, it kind of had this timeless appeal to it. it. It's the same experience that somebody a hundred years ago would have had in the same place um, at that time of year. And, and you do kind of enter into this kind of place where you're not local to your time anymore. You're, you're kind of in this wider context, this, you know, 5,000 year old monument and you're there on that one day. Um, and, you know, it's, it's going to be there 5,000 years after you die. It's a really mind boggling concept. You know, you're plugging into something that's much bigger than yourself. Um, and I find it fascinating. I really do. On the topic of time, though, this was something else I was going to talk to you about was um, the double numbers thing. Yeah, eleven, eleven, the eleven, eleven phenomenon. Yeah, what what's that all about? Tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, well, that's that's something that a lot of people are seeing when they're looking at the, the clock randomly any time of day. You'll you'll pick up the clock or you pick up your phone, you check the time, and it'll be eleven, eleven, or it'll be one, one, one. It'll be 22 minutes past two or, or something like that and more and more people are saying well this is happening to me and um, I've, I've looked at that over the years as well um, from a number of different points of view um, from from a very empirical scientific point of view you know uh, there's that element of meaning to it when when somebody looks at 11 11 on the clock and and they notice it a couple of times in a row you you assign meaning to that and you will look at the that event as being more powerful than the 30 times you looked at the clock during the day and didn't notice the time because it didn't fall into that 1111 category or the 222 or the 111 or the 555. Um, but then I've looked at it from a, a, another point of view of like a fractal holographic universe. And these times when you notice 111 or 1111 or something like that, these events are meaningful to us. And they have a fractal effect. So I was looking for other numbers in my experience. So I'd look at the clock and I'd see 11, 11. And I'd look around me and I'd say, okay, is there any other numbers around me? And I found multiples of, of other numbers around. So I'd look at the time and it would be 22, 22. And the battery percentage on my phone would be 33%. Um, I'd look at the time that somebody liked a, a status on Facebook and it would be 11 minutes ago after I posted 11.11 and it, it would it would have spin-off numbers and these became more prevalent in my environment so I, I would be able to um, have multiple layers of numbers that, that kind of spun off from the original 11.11 and so I told a few people and then they started experiencing this as well and I find it fast. I'm not 100% sure why it happens, but I'm, I think that our, our numbers that surround us have meaning, there, there's numerology, there's, there's kind of layers of depth you can get into when it, analyzing these numbers and seeing their prevalence. There's so many links with 11.11 to 9.11 uh, to, to the events of September 11th. Um, it was Flight 11 that flew into the towers. The, the towers themselves look like an 11. Um, you know, depending on how deep you go, there are spin-off numbers after spin-off numbers after spin-off numbers. I think September the 11th is the 111th day before the end of the year. You know, it, 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 there's, the deeper you go, the more you will find. And that's like a, that's like a, fa a fractal. As you go deeper in, the more detail is formed. And, and I think that these numbers are significant in that way. You know, it's a, a hint at this fractal um, function or fractal structure that the universe has the self similar um, mathematical depth that we, we we only scratch the surface of most times and that our our brains are programmed to recognize patterns 
Yeah. Um, and yeah, and particularly, yeah, fr- fractal patterns as well. I mean, that's how the universe unfolds. That's the secret to creation. Um, so why wouldn't we notice it? But it is an interesting question to just sit with how, you know, these synchronicities in our lives, if it's that we pay attention to it, that makes it significant, or, it, you know, and or, is it that we're paying attention to it that, that the sync becomes more um, synky? <laughs> you know? I, I, um, I got into a really annoying game with a friend of mine where we would race each other to text um, the other person the time. So if it was, say, 11-11, I would win this game by texting my friend um, at 11-11. And if I got there first, I would win. If he got there first, he would win. Um, and this increased exponentially the amount of these numbers that I saw because I got a kind of payoff for noticing them. Um, and I think it kind of fed a part of me um, to, to, to kind of see these. But what was weird was that it would start to be too um, present, if that makes any sense. I'd walk into a room and there'd be a clock there and it would say one minute past one and I'd be like oh look there's that that number again um but there there was no kind of it was almost like the universe was playing a trick on me you know it was doing it just just because I'd started to notice it it was like I'm going to do this every day now I'm I'm going to run your life by these numbers and I would I would open uh some post and I'd I'd find in there that the phone number for whoever it was was contacting me was all 11s um the, the price of certain things, I'd go in and pay with a note and I'd get £1.11 change. Um, and it, it became really quite like, the do you know the film Number 23 um, with Jim Carrey? It's almost like it, it aggressively follows him and it, it becomes a bit dark almost that these numbers are, are chasing it. And that concept that a, a number, you know, just a, a thing that we've invented to quantify stuff can, can almost have a personality or a presence. And that I discovered very quickly that these numbers, if you if you if you follow them or if you play with them, they'll they'll play back. And that's weird. That's really strange. And this is something you can practice yourself. You can you can you know say, oh, there's that eleven eleven again because you've made it important. It will it will play back, and you'll see it more often, or you'll 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 come across these numbers, and they'll they'll have a meaning to you. Um, but as to how to kind of interpret that meaning or, or, or get some kind of conversation going I'm still working on that <laughs> well here's one of the things you know a couple of the things that came across my mind when you're talking about it one when you said it's like the universe is playing a trick on me and I'm thinking well you are the universe so you're playing a trick on yourself or you're reminding yourself that you are the universe um, or part of it <laughs> if you, yeah, so the more right. attention that you pay to it, there's a reason you're paying. It's like you're remembering that you, this consciousness, is something that you can tap into because it's you. You're part of it. Um, so <laughs> I'm a big fan of the universe playing tricks on me. <laughs> uh, yeah, sounds cool. I, th- I think at least it's got a sense of humor. Absolutely, just like you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm the best. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, Haven Inn was covered. Um, ancient sites, time, uh, Subud. Here's my next, my next random curveball. Are you ready? I'm ready. Subud. Have you ever heard of Subud? No. Yeah, well, Subud is a, a spiritual exercise that I've I've become involved in. Um, it it has roots in Indonesia. So when I was over in uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, I, I kind of found out about this uh, spiritual exercise that people were doing called Latihan. Um, and Latihan is, I guess, an exercise um, of letting go and surrendering. Um, and it, it has some roots to um, Islam. It was, it was formed by a guy called Bapak Subu, Bapak Muhammad Subu. Sumahan Winjojo. <laughs> That's a terrible name. You'll have to pardon my pronunciation of that. Um, he had somewhat of an awakening uh, one day and found that he could inspire this surrendering in other people. Um, and 
this exercise that, that, that people in Subud do is a surrender to the Almighty, whatever that means to them, you know, whether it's God, whether it's Allah, whether it's the, the universal mother, whatever it is, they surrender to it and it takes control of their body and they, they begin to dance, they begin to move, maybe they, they move to sing or, or do um, ancient chanting or, or t- speaking in tongues in some cases. Um, and they have a profound kind of connection through this exercise to the Almighty. And they found that during the course of this exercise that their connection becomes more of an ambient thing in their life. The, the, the connection to God, to spirituality, to to the universe um, is, is kind of functioned out through their through their day to day life. Um, and it, I, I found it fascinating. So this is another thing that I'm involved in now as well. Um, Subud is, is kind of a, a, a abbreviation of the words Susila, Buddhi and Dharma. So Susila is um, good behavior, acting, um, acting in a, a way which is in life enforcing i guess life enhancing uh buddhi is the power of life that's within a human being so um subud's about contacting that kind of life within you and allowing it to expand so that so that you have more life force as it were and then there's dharma which is surrender and accepting what what life brings you kind of not fighting it just letting go and letting life and letting god bring you positivity and positive experiences um and i found not many people know about subud and to me it it ticks a lot of boxes for authentic spiritual experience um there's no there's no preaching there's no priest that that guides the congregation it's just a group of people that come together and experience their own personal kind of surrender to to whatever their great spirit is you know whether it's god or whether it's nature or whatever um, they often experience um, a kind of sinking with the other members of, of the group. So, so whereas you might be moved to dance, you're dancing with your eyes closed and other people are dancing around you and yet there's no collisions. Um, there's no, whoops, sorry, I trod on your toe. It, you know, these are people who are being moved almost involuntarily um, and, and they're not co- colliding, they're, they're kind of sinking. And, and if you listen to um, a subud latihan where, where people are practicing, the singing, even though people are singing different things, some may be singing Christian hymns, some may be singing the Moisines call to prayer, some may be just chanting or making noises, it actually kind of forms a crescendo and there's this, this kind of sinking of the experience. And that's fascinating and it, it's an amazing thing. Um, at least I've found a lot of value from it, practicing it myself. I've found that my decisions have been clearer. I've, I've, um, I've known intuitively which way to go or what experiences to investigate. And it's helped me in learning to surrender, in learning to kind of say, you know, I, I know I've got my own plan that I've come up with in my own mind, but I'm going to surrender to what comes. I'm going to experience life as it happens in the flow. I'm not going to, I'm not going to kind of pre plan and, and attach myself to that as hard as I can. I'm going to kind of go with the flow and see where it goes. The, the experience of um, divinity or, or letting go or of the universe as, as a whole, you know, the, the spiritual experience is something that um, people have gotten away from uh, quite a bit that the only con- concepts of divinity are in the brain so they're not in, in the experience and so then then we argue about um, God is this God is that instead of, of just allowing ourselves to experience whatever uh, divinity could be uh, so I think that's, that's really important. Some of what the way that you were describing it, um, the experience is kind of like a, um, a Quaker meeting, uh, yeah. but well, less, I mean, less dancing I'd, in the Quaker meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I live in a place in Birmingham that's very near to the Cadbury's factory, and Cadbury's is a, a chocolate manufacturer um, here in, in UK. I would imagine they, they sell chocolates in America as well, and they were a, a Quaker family. So there's lots of Quaker meeting houses around here. 
and I, I went to one of these and, and chatted to the guys there and I was asking, do you actually still quake? Do you, do you shake? Do, is there any kind of a, you know, is there any kind of physical experience that comes with this? But nowadays they just kind of sit in silence and, and I guess that's, that's how they do it this day. But yeah, Quaker, Quakers used to quake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a whole sect um, called Shakers, and they they danced as well, um, and um, not just the quaking. But my I, my family is is Quaker, but not what they call birthright Quaker, but convinced. So my mother became a Quaker when I was about thirteen, um, and so that's what I was raised in. I don't think I really, I mean, I like going and stuff, but I don't really consider myself a Quaker, so to speak. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, really describe you and the complexity that, that is you and your relationship to the divine. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so I, and when, in the beginning of the show, we're, we're probably going to take a break here at the top of the hour um, pretty soon, but um, the way that you described your journey and your experience is I could really relate to it because that's um, so similar to mine and um, my own journey and quest to, to try to heal myself and um, find practices, spiritual practices that work for me um, and help and, and the whole trauma thing, overcoming trauma. And I was really, you know, right before the show, I was talking to my friend about the, that very subject of, you know, why do I have to continually deal with this issue um, over and over? It really <laughs> it just pisses me off. It's like you think you get somewhere with it and then you grow and then you're like, oh, here it is again because I've grown and now I have to look at it again from this new grown place of where I am. And, um, you know, and it just sort of seems like there, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Please. I mean, yeah, well, with, with, with Havening and, and my particular trauma, um, it, it got me to a point where I, uh, I feel like I'm past it now. I've moved beyond it, and I, a lot of the wounds which were... Um, very evident. We're going to we're going to take that break now. So when we get come back, you can tell me more about what you're Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi everyone, we're back. You're listening to The Bridge with Kira. I'm your host, Kira Young, and we're on Revolution Radio. My guest tonight is James Houghton. Welcome back to The Bridge. I hope you had a good little break there. I'm having a load of fun, yeah. <laughs> Good. So you were um, in the middle of talking about a little bit more about your experience with the havening and how it's sort of better than peeling the onion work with trauma that we all. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that's come out of havening, which which is similar to techniques like uh, tapping, the EFT, the Callahan techniques, um, and also the EMDR. And these techniques are, are valid, and people have results using them um so why havening what, what what's so special about havening basically dr rudin who who's developed these techniques um is a doctor of internal medicine and a practice in manhattan he's been running that since 1983 he is a very um respected uh doctor uh, and he's developed these techniques using medical science his his um experience uh, in traumatology, 15 years he's been studying this with his brother, and uh, the pair of them have come up with this this set of techniques, a set of protocols which effectively kind of deconstruct a traumatic memory, um, and and it frees you from the, the sort of automatic responses of the body, um, and the, the the healing comes from human touch, the the stimulation of nerves in the skin sends an electrochemical message to particular parts of the brain and, and causes a kind of slow wave brain wave function. Um, I guess the, the, the delta waves that you get in the deepest part of sleep, um, obviously, you know, as you go to sleep, you, you go into these different stages, you get the, the light stage, you, well, rewinding even further, you get that kind of hypnagogic state just before you fall asleep, then you get you know, the start of sleep, the onset of sleep, you get um, REM 
sleep, we have the, the dreams and, and when your eyes are moving. And then you've got this sort of N3 stage where delta waves are very prevalent in the brain and you are completely dead to the world. You know, have you ever tried to wake somebody up? We've had to slap them in the face and they're just not going to wake up. That's when you get these delta waves and it, it's the most restorative part of sleep when you're in that, that de delta wave brain state. Um, that's that's when your body really starts to heal and restore itself. And if you're deprived of this stage of sleep, it becomes very apparent. You you, you start to look like you're breaking down. You, you get bags under your eyes. You, you start to hear noises that aren't there. And, and after a very short time, just a two, three days of, of not experiencing delta waves, you, you start to really suffer psychologically and it, it can be similar to the onset of a psychotic episode so what havening looks to do is is to create these delta waves and use them in a very specific way to to depotentiate the the cells in the brain um it differs from things like hypnosis and neurolinguistic programming in that those modalities look to change the software of, of your thoughts you know they look to change how you think about things the 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 experiential elements of those thoughts you know how far away they are from you whether the pictures are big or bright those those changes are meant to have a positive effect when you're doing havening you're actually changing the chemistry of your brain you're actually um, taking the synaptic connections and changing the chemistry between the synapses in your brain and this has an effect of a, a therapeutic effect that's bottom up. So you're actually changing how your brain processes information as opposed to changing the information. Um, and as a healing modality, I've seen stuff happen so quickly. People blasting through things that would have taken months, you know, in just minutes. Um, phobias, for example. Um, I've, I've seen a convincing phobia cure using havening in less than 10 minutes and this is without any kind of exposure this is without any kind of you know bringing in of the the thing that they're they're phobic of and and slowly bringing them closer to it none of that just talking about it doing the havening techniques and then the phobias vanished and even though it's still experimental and some of these stories are anecdotal i can promise you if you bring me someone with a phobia 10 minutes later they're going, I, I can't understand where it's gone. And, and these techniques are so powerful, but there's some challenges I foresee for them in the future. Um, first of all, there's the touch element. Um, that's always a minefield when, when you're, you're talking about a client therapist relationship. Um, touch is, is generally seen as forbidden um, when dealing with, with uh, the, the institutions that deal with trauma, traumatology. Um, clients being touched by the therapist is is a bit of a no-no um, yeah which i think is is part of the the problem uh yeah <laughs> I, I do think that's part of the problem i understand where it comes from but i think it's yeah. part of the illness and part of the the trauma which which is you know we all need that so we you know we have to stop being afraid of of that um, i think it's an institutional bias against against touch yeah um, the other challenges havening faces is i mean every um every state in america under the 10th amendment has the ability to make its own laws regarding psychological treatments and and uh, experimental therapies and and um you know the, these kind of alternative modalities um and some of the laws across the country are limiting in in what you can kind of what you can say about your technique or what, how you advertise yourself and and this could be a barrier to to spreading the technique to people who need it um it it's quite an astonishing thing and it will change the lives of many many people if there's a way of getting it out to people rolling it out that doesn't kind of doesn't acknowledge the nature of what it is it, it's a touch therapy which changes the brain and that then causes the therapeutic effect the brain is a clever thing and if, if left to do its job properly it will self therapize um the 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 brain has an amazing processing cap capability the amount of information it drags out of our environment 
through our senses is in the tens of millions of bits per second. And it processes this in a, in a very functional way most of the time. Then you have this traumatic experience and your brain, as, as part of your survival, changes how it interprets certain bits of information. The path it takes through your senses to your, your thalamus and, and to your amygdala in your brain and how that information is then sent on from there um, can, can be the difference between um, living a relatively normal life and being constantly haunted by memories of the past, things that have happened, um, and and the physical problems that that can kind of drag along or drag up with it. One way to get it out there would be to teach it to nurses, because nurses have to touch the patients. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, Dr. Rudin um, is approaching mostly people who are already involved in, in therapy in some way. So he, he is looking to kind of spread it through... Um, practitioners who are already practicing and giving it to them as a tool um, extra to what they've got as well so so they may have you know they may be an EMDR practitioner they may be a, a TFT EFT practitioner and then giving them this as well as the, the tools they've already got so he's trying to kind of get it out through a, an established channel as it were but he's also you know, he's, he's, he's looking to, to spread it to countries. Um, recently, he was approached by a charity to do work in Haiti because um, obviously the, there's um, massive trauma there, massive uh, trauma from an environmental catastrophe and earthquakes. And, and you know, th th this has totally disrupted the, the normal functioning of already an impoverished area. So it was already vulnerable before the earthquakes happened, before, you know, um, the, the these uh, families were torn apart by the natural disasters um, and he's been approached by charities to get haveners over there to teach the existing framework of nurses and, and doctors how to do havening so that they can treat the trauma aspect of what's been going on um, so you know he's, he's, a, he's a, a very intelligent man and he's he's looking to do this what sold it to me is is his way of looking at looking to do this for the benefit of mankind you know, it, he he is um, giving it to the world and saying, "Look, this this technique that I've discovered, developed with my brother, is is an incredible step forward in treating things like uh, trauma-related illness very, very quickly with minimal suffering um, to the to the patient." I, th I think in EMDR, I'm not an EMDR practitioner. Correct me if I'm wrong. In EMDR, you do have to kind of dig up some of the the, the trauma, some of the details of the trauma, and kind of work through them. Um, with havening, you can kind of work content free with havening. You don't have to talk about any of it if you don't want to. Um, it's really kind of got a lot of a lot to offer um, as a technique. Uh, you can just work on the emotion rather than some of the detail. Um, some people who've been molested or or have family members that have abused them, they don't want to talk about this. You know, it, it might be uncomfortable or embarrassing. Um, and they don't have to. As part of the havening techniques, you can actually treat these things without digging it up and, and post-morteming it and going through the details. It, it's very, very rapid and can treat things in people that are, that are you know, difficult using other modalities. There's a, a huge connection between addiction and trauma and abuse, and really we're finding that that's the main cause, really, of, um, yeah. of addiction. So I see the um, potential for treating addiction is really high with this modality, as, as you've described it. Yeah, um, well, uh, Dr. Rudin's first book um, was The Craving Brain, and, and he, he did a lot of discussion into, um, like, what, what um, neurologic, neurobiological factors there are in, in addictive behaviors um, and I, I think you're right I mean thinking about the aborigines as we previously discussed alcohol is a big a big problem um, in those communities and it's, it's way more dangerous than some of the other drugs <laughs> that, that we could talk about but um, yeah I, I think in terms of treating a whole group of people uh, havening is elegant and straightforward and um, it's only a matter of time before it's accepted by the mainstream because I, I've seen 
amazing things that you just cannot cannot compete with um you know the, i know it's anecdotal at the moment and and it's like oh i did this for this person i did that for that person but i personally know more than three people who've turned around from the point of suicide um using these techniques and it, it's it, it literally lifts it from you so uh, an analogy that i use is that you've been carrying around your baggage for years and years and years and then someone's come along and said you can put that down now and the sense of freedom it gives you is amazing and so simple it's such simple simple technique just using gentle human touch to to elicit these brain waves that cause such a powerful healing response um it's amazing the work that dr rudin's done and i uh, i'm very happy and very proud to be a practitioner of these techniques well, I li wish I lived closer to Birmingham because <laughs> oh, I would totally funny, check it out. The best thing about you can do Havening via Skype. Um, as as weird as that sounds, I mean, I know like in kind of an energy therapy setting, um, the practitioner being in the same room as the as the client has to kind of be there, doesn't it? But with Havening, you can actually do Havening very effectively via Skype. You don't even have to be in the same place so there's a there's a kind of a havening without borders movement at the minute where where we're looking to kind of spread out um globally doing havening via skype um and and kind of offering that to people so that they don't have to be in the same place as the practitioner no. so uh so if people if people are interested uh how do they get in touch with you right um the, Probably the first place they should go is to havening.org, um, which is a website which describes the techniques. Um, there's links on there to scholarly articles, white papers. Um, there's also a full list of practitioners, um, and you can see their, their history. You can see their, their qualifications, and you can pick a practitioner that, that's, that you feel comfortable with, and you can contact them they'll either offer you Skype sessions or, or you can contact them directly with their, their details are on the website. I have a website which is thathaveningguy.com um, and you can get in touch with me there or, or james at thathaveningguy.com um, via email. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a, a grassroots thing at the moment. Probably worldwide we're talking currently 200 practitioners. Um, and maybe in the next 12 months, we're looking to double that number. So if you go to havening.org, you can also get in touch with the trainers who are on there and they will um, be able to roll out the techniques and train health professionals and healthcare providers in these techniques. So they've got an extra tool that they can use for those clients that may be, you know, suffering uh, from trauma. So you can also find information on becoming a practitioner yourself as well as yeah, treatment. Yeah, there's, there's, um, there's yeah. a few trainers. Um, I think in, in North America where you are, you can actually train with the doctors, uh, Dr. Rudin and his brother Stephen Rudin. You can actually go and train with them in New York. Um, over here, there's, there's, um, there's a few trainers in Europe. In Europe, it's kind of spreading a little easier because the, uh, the regulatory framework is, is a little more flexible. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a guy called Tony Burgess who's, who's like the, the European head of training and he can, um, uh, train you himself or he can put you in touch with a, a registered trainer and they will teach you in the science, um, the neuroscience behind the techniques, um, why this technique is different from things like EMDR, Reiki, different from um, the Callahan techniques. And these, the scientific basis of it, um, it's, it's not based on, on Eastern uh, acupuncture points or, or um, energy flows. I'm not poo-pooing that. I think that that's, a, that's an important science that we perhaps need to learn from. But this is Western medical science. This is... Um, the science you'd get from your general practitioner it's it's empirical it's fact-based um neurotransmitters biology it's it's as rooted in reality as you can get for an energy therapy um and it, it's one of the most effective electroceuticals you can get um in that the the electricity that comes through your brain from the touch causes the healing response 
So, yeah. So this is great. I mean, this is something I'm actually really, really interested in and very synchronicitous in, in many, many ways, yeah, <laughs> this well, conversation. Right to, to find out you become a practitioner. Um, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to do for somebody as well. Um, I've just said that it's all based in science, but when, when, you, when you see it, it looks like you're performing some kind of ma magic trick. Um, you, you, you begin kind of connecting with your client's energy. And as you're doing the, the behavening, you become ever so intuitive to, to the thoughts that are going through your client's head. And it's a, a, a weird kind of dynamic that, that emerges between the client and the, and the therapist. Um, which is quite astonishing. And when, when you've experienced it, it's a little bit like, if you can imagine, like a Vulcan mind meld. <laughs> I know that sounds ever so kind of... <laughs> but you, you, you kind of connect to your client on a very deep level. You're both experiencing delta waves, this deep part of the unconscious mind. And, and the connection you get is very, very intimate. You, you feel kind of... Um, like you're reaching parts of them that are not normally reached and it's so fast and you just see you can actually witness the healing taking place as as you're doing it it's a fascinating thing to see anecdotally um on a biological level you can actually see the physiological changes you can see the skin starting to smooth you can see the sweat disappearing you can you can kind of feel the relief in the room as they kind of let it go it's a very interesting experience fascinating if you've got animals or children in the room or nearby animals cannot wait until you're doing the havening they just want to get involved the the cats i know antisocial cats that will come and sit on your lap whilst you're having havening just for that moment whilst the havening is taking place it's a very strange thing um Children, no matter where they are in the house, will, will descend on the room where the havening is taking place just as you start. It's a, a very odd thing energetically. Um, and I find that element is possibly the bit of the science we don't get. But of, as regards to the effects of, of the actual havening touch, Dr. Rudin's done the maths on that. He, he knows down to the down to the individual neurons what is happening in the brain as, as you're doing the havening touch and it, it's fascinating the science of it i think we'd all be hard pressed to find somebody who hasn't experienced some sort of trauma um but for some I, the the effect is quite um uh, heavy duty really hardcore uh yeah it can, it can change the arc of your life yeah the, the curve which you you know the plan you you wanted to, to make and then the plan you have to make after a trauma are two very different destinations and i think whereas havening can't always get you back to where you originally were when you've had a havening i think you become much more kind of at peace with the path that you're on um, and you can you can lead it to a much more positive outcome and you're not carrying with you this oh this story of what happened to me and and I'm like this because of this and it just kind of it kind of melts away inexplicably and you just experience life back in the flow you become more authentically you and your health kind of moves forward in, in quantum leaps afterwards it, it's quite an astonishing thing i sound like i'm evangelizing about it this is <laughs> it's it's um it's an astonishing thing to witness and I, I would recommend it to anybody who's experienced any kind of trauma or health issue relating to a trauma do you think it it can help people who've you know um gone the um pharmaceutical route and taken yeah. uh antidepressants and painkillers and all of those types of um, Western ways of dealing with trauma and injury. Yeah, I, I, I have heard Dr. Rudin describe havening as a third pillar. So you've got the the pharmaceutical route, which which um, a lot of people obviously um, are Prozacs and you know all all the antidepressants that they they've thrown at people. That's the pharmaceutical pillar. Then you've got the talk therapy pillars, the the cognitive behavioral therapy, the the um, 12 step programs, you know, the, the talking, the hypnosis, the neuro linguistic program, these are all another pillar, the talk therapies. And then you've got the third pillar, which is 
like a psychosensory um, pillow looking at depotentiation of the events. So you get general depotentiators like yoga and Tai Chi and art therapies and and um, uh, rolfing and, and chiropractic, you know, anything where you, you, you're kind of manipulated in, in a sensory way generally. And then you get the specific psychosensory therapies like the, the EFT, the TFT, the, the EMDR and havening. And these are um, like laser specific to, to whatever you're working on at the time. A, an example would be if someone is phobic of both cats and dogs, if you do the havening techniques on cats, the, the phobia of dogs still exists. Um, it's very specific in, in what it works on. Um, so it can be used to work on a very specific um, thing in this in this general context of a psychosensory therapy. But yeah, being on one pillar doesn't affect the other pillar. If you're if you're taking tablets, if you're in a prescription, carry on, carry on with that. Use this in addition to what your your medical practitioner is prescribing. You can you can talk to them and say, get me some havening. You know, I I, I need to move past this. This is really going to do me some good. Um, yeah. Yeah, many people think that, you know, doctors want to keep their patients on, um, you know, drugs. And maybe some do, but uh, I don't think they all do. I think all of them want to see good outcomes. Most of them want to see good outcomes, but I think that they're limited in what their modality can do. So... um, you know, uh, I'm I'm really thinking about people also who want to get off of pharmaceuticals. Like the the pharmaceuticals are supposed to be, you know, a temporary sort of stopgap, <laughs> um, not a permanent solution to what should be a temporary problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the other problem. This pharmaceuticals is side effects and and you know dosing and, and dependency like what you're talking about with with ending up on these these drugs for long periods of time. Um, I I think that, that havening offers something in that the it, it can be used by the the end user by themselves. You don't often need a therapist there. Um, for example, if if someone was prone to panic attacks, they could then use havening live in the moment whilst they're feeling anxious, whilst the panic attack is having its onset. Havening can be taught so that you can haven yourself and carry it with you. Um, so it, it's it's important, I believe, because it gives a kind of a bit of discretion back to the to the person who's poorly, that the, the, the patient needs that kind of control. Um, pharmaceuticals, obviously, they, they, they work on the biology, they work on, on a chemical level. Um, Obviously, you know, there's dosing things, there's there's dependency issues, there's side effects, there's all this kind of thing. Um, I I think that that to ignore a, a technique which offers so much promise as havening um, would be a, a very very I don't know unethical move for a, a conscientious practitioner. Um, if if it was available, I would be looking to get that to my clients so that they can kind of heal. Um, without pharmaceuticals, but uh, there's obviously a lot of hoops to jump through before that's the case. But um, that's the future I foresee. I, I think electroceuticals is going to be a, a big, a big area um, in the future of medicine. I'm curious what your thoughts are um, about cannabis as a as a medicine. Um, just yeah. just curious about that. Yeah, I'm I'm of the of the opinion that cannabis is um, historically it's been used as medicine 3000 years of history you know uh, it's been used in ancient India there's some people that say that even Jesus healed with cannabis I know that that's a, a, a incredibly faux pas thing to say on the radio but they, they say that you know some of the healing oils that Jesus used may have contained cannabinoids um, there's lots of evidence that um it can help with things like seizures there's lots of evidence that it can help with um pain um it seems strange that they've invested so much research into opiates to control pain and yet cannabis and cannabinoids is so under researched and there's such restrictions on it um i think that 
it would be a good thing globally if we all kind of grew up on the topic of cannabis and and realized that it is it holds massive potential um to 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 cure um chronic problems that people have been having with pain seizures um cancer there's the the Rick Sampson stuff that he's put out i i i don't know i i reckon they should investigate they should invest money in finding out what in cancer is is causing these cells to to pops what's that word it's horrible a pops as eyes they self destruct anyway as soon as they get in contact with these cannabinoids the, the cells kind of start to 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 self destruct and and stop reproducing in such an aggressive way so i mean there's research that needs to be done and whilst cannabis is illegal that research is under license and it's very very hard to do research in that field um and i think it's it's almost a crime against those people who are suffering to withhold it to retard it based on what's effectively a 1960s point of view on cannabis a very conservative um kind of thing that you know everybody's going to be experiencing reefer madness they're all going to be becoming violent and you know all of these <clears throat> social issues which are no longer a thing um people are getting arrested and put in prison for 9 10 years for just like an ounce of a, a herb um is is a very weird thing to to go on in a society where you know um more people are killed by police than were killed in the Iraq war it's it's a weird kind of headspace you have to get into to 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 think you know that 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 would seem like a a social norm or, or the right thing to do to lock somebody up for for that period of time but in terms of the the, the future i mean washington is is has made um denver colorado they've made it across the board legal um the the information that's coming out of those states now is fascinating murder rates are going down um so does that mean that that legalizing cannabis reduces the murder rate or does it mean that prohibiting it increases the murder rate i don't know and opi- opioid deaths are going down yeah. tremendously like huge yeah. Um, yeah. that's For big sure. too. And, and if we look, if we really look at the numbers, people, people are dying from pharmaceuticals. They're not dying from oh, illegal good. drugs and nobody's ever died from cannabis <laughs> ever in the history of humans. So, um, yeah, it's, it's about, um, the truth, uh, and it's about control. It's about money. It's about, um, you know, mistaking pathology for leadership. Um, yeah. You know, and and the the fact remains that the the social the ideas of what social realities go along with cannabis or um, cultural issues um, those are really sort of Hollywood versions of reality anyway. Um, you know, the reality is that probably a lot more people than you could possibly realize um, consume cannabis because we you know. And that's the other thing. When there's huge amounts of people consuming it, but doing it in secret, <laughs> there's yeah. no way to accurately tell what percentage of people suffer from right. sort of the, neg- the negatives that result in you know, like the cannabis psychosis, which is is always banded around by people, and and some of the social problems that the excessive cannabis use um, cause. But um, I think nowadays, especially with the internet and especially with Facebook and, and the ability to share information very very fast, I think that it's only going to be a matter of time before the the establishment have to face the facts that this incredible uh, opportunity exists to examine some of the some of the the healing properties that cannabis offers um i myself think that it should be legalized across the board i don't think that um uh, having cannabis illegal serves any purpose well it serves the establishment quite a bit yeah (laughs) well it's really funny if you you were arrested in the united kingdom uh with a small amount of cannabis you're taken to a court and on the wall in the court is a seal um of a a unicorn and a lion and they're, they're engaged in this weird kind of battle across a crown and it's exactly the same seal that's available on the outside of some cigarette packets here for tobacco and some alcoholic products um so it's a little bit like the 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 stamp of the business that you're going to 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 be prosecuted for having a small amount of herbs or plant matter on you is is then going to be met with this this litigious 
um, criminal law firm that are actually growing fields and fields of tobacco that, that are killing people at a massive rate and brewing up all kinds of toxic intoxicating liquors and, and the, the, the symbol that you come into court and face is stamped on the bottle and it's stamped on the cigarettes it's it's a weird kind of um dichotomy we live in you know we we we're taken to prison for the stuff that's good for us and they say yeah have as many cigarettes as you want you know it's corporate murder of hundreds of thousands of people on on a yearly basis and if you multiply out worldwide millions of people died from tobacco and alcohol and then if you add in pharmaceuticals as well the numbers go astronomical um and i think this is part of my reason for getting involved with havening is, is to look to heal people using as little as possible and having them the biggest possible effect um and i think that's that's really why i got into it um in the first place is, is to to offer somebody something that will will cause them the biggest effect for them with the least possible input you know and and chance of it going wrong or or uh, any kind of uh, problems um back in the 90s and early 2000s when i was living in the bay area um san francisco bay area there it was uh cannabis was legal there for medical use and purposes and one of the things that they started in san francisco was called uh, harm reduction it was for really hardcore alcoholics who um you know, we're having problems with their liver, and if they didn't, you know, stop, they're going to die type of situations. And um, offered a space where um, alcoholics could come and um, smoke, smoke cannabis instead of drinking in a social environment, like a pool table, um, you know, maybe um, like some coffee, stuff like that where yeah. they get, they're still getting the social and um, community that they need. Uh, but And also, you know, maybe taking a load off and relaxing a little. Um, and I saw that save lives. So, um, you know, now that I'm here on the East Coast where it's illegal, I'm watching people, you know, die of stage four liver failure instead. And knowing what could help them and, you know, just waiting for Congress. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, just, uh, yeah. I think, I think the problem that they face is that then what do they say to all the people that they've put in prison for it before? You know, that they're, they're worried that it's going to cause some kind of... You're free. You're free now. Yeah. We you fucked up. You can go. Up. Yeah. We'll take it all back. We messed together. up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah. That would, even that would be better than, than carrying on the charade and keeping it going. Right. And the can down the road for the next legislator. To, I'm not taking the fall on this one. I'm yeah. To the next guy. Um, well, yeah, the other side yeah. is is that you know pris- the prison system in the in this country is a for profit system, which is yeah. utterly insane. Utterly insane. It, it means that we put people in prison for money, not to keep society safe. Because we're living in a culture where you get more time for marijuana than raping a baby. That's not civilization. That's bullshit. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I think that the, the, the law establishment needs to kind of get over this um, this kind of attitude of... Um, we're the law, so we're right. They kind of need to look at it from a much more kind of evolved and mature point of view. For example, with the um, the way that the New York police handled the thing with Eric Garner and the, the I Can't Breathe and Black, Black Lives Matter it was very confrontational, very um, we're right, you're wrong, you need to follow our lead, you need to you need, you need to go by the plays that we put down. And And if they would have gone, oh, do you know what? Yeah, the guy broke procedure. We're disciplining. We're going to train everybody up not to do stuff like that. And if they'd have handled it in a more progressive way and kind of said, um, you know, that, that we can make mistakes, you know, we're sorry, we'll put our hands up, we'll learn from it, we'll move forward. It would have been so much better for, for all the police involved, all the people that, you know, that would have felt safe being policed by these people. And, and it would have it would have moved society on as opposed to sticking to your guns and saying, you know, we're right, you're wrong, you need to respect our authority, 
blue lives matter we you know all this kind of stuff and and it's true blue lives do matter but engaging in this conflict and creating this division is not helping blue lives it's making their lives more difficult burnout for for police and alcoholism in police and marriage failure in police is chronic um, with you guys over there it's it's the, the the constant stimulation for eight hours a day of a police officer is forbidding him relaxing and recuperating and, and healing um, and these the, the statistics um, for police officers divorce rates alcoholism um, you know all all manner of problems that arise from this very very high pressure job that they're in um, can also be helped by havening and and I think that getting havening out to, to those guys so that they can manage their work stress, manage their workload, is going to benefit the whole society that they serve because they're going to be able to do it from a place of calm and non-confrontational kind of non-autonomic um, activation, you know, so they're not in fight or flight before they've been interacted with the, with the person that they're coming to, to, to interact with. Um, and and you know the whole system of a prison industrial complex is insane <laughs> you you've got prisons being built out there which which guarantee um contractually that they're going to be full 100% of the time to their investors so you've got to keep putting people in prison so you've got to keep inventing laws to be able to put those people in prisons and it, it's it's a, a a a social cancer you know, this, this kind of, well, we'll take people who are minorities, we'll take people who are financially poor, people who can't afford a good attorney, and we'll lock them up and we'll get them working for us for nothing and we'll get them productive, but on, a, on an industrial scale like workhouses, but we'll call them prisons and we'll, we'll call the contracts justice. <laughs> right. Not, not true. Yeah. On, on the subject of inventing things to put people in jail for, I was reading recently that Michigan had outlawed oral and anal sex. <laughs> so how yeah, are they absolutely. how are they going to catch people? That's <laughs> what I'm wondering. I, like, I want to know when Michigan outlawed sex with animals. Did that happen? Did that happen I know. Yet? Can, can you still do that? But not... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or, or anal sex. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, what, what, what group in, in society is going to be most affected by a ban on oral and anal sex hmm, that that's really hard to figure out i don't know well, yeah <laughs> is there a section of section of society we wish to criminalize there um they're doing the same kind of thing over here in the uk with um something called the um oh what's the name of the act now it's basically a blanket ban on anything that creates a psychoactive response in a human being the psychoactive substances bill or something like that and it, it's a horrifically retarded piece of legislation um effectively sugar could be could be classed as a psychoactive substance because when you have enough of it it changes your brain state but obviously it's not going to be included um poppers which is um obviously used by members of the, the uh, gay community they're going to be made illegal so now criminalizing a whole group of gay people um, people who just want to go out and have a good time, people who want to wind down with, with, with cannabis or whatever, all these people are going to be extra criminalized by this bill. And, um, yeah, I think that, that lawmakers need to kind of look at that about themselves. Why, why do we need to stop people engaging in anal sex in their own private rooms? What, what benefit is that to society? It's not debauchery. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not causing anybody any problem unless you spend a lot of time thinking about it like these legislators do. Um, I, I find it unbelievable that, that as a society we accept the word of the bigot. We accept the, the legislature that puts in these retarded laws. And I think it, it's incumbent on all of us to kind of pay attention to these people. And if they get you know, to the point where they're writing laws which are bad for the society, we should say, no, you're not doing that. And, and you know, over here we've got petitions and petitioning system, but they'll, they'll even ignore that. Um, recently in the UK, we had a petition to legalise cannabis. Across the board, legalise cannabis. The, the person who started the petition went into the economics of cannabis. Um, something like a, a billion extra pounds for the exchequer would be generated in taxes and saved in, in policing costs and prison costs. Um, and we have a, a system over here in the UK of austerity where 
you know, we're tightening our belts because we've got to pay the bills. Um, so here's a piece of legislation that can be easily affected. We're, we're debating it at the moment with the psychoactive substances. Make cannabis legal, regulate it, license it, tax it. And there's an extra billion in the bank for you. And they wouldn't even debate it properly. Over two and a half hundred thousand people signed that petition. And the government just went, no, we're not going to we're not going to pay any attention to that. that. That's not something we're willing to discuss. Um, and and that's not really a democracy, is it? When when 250,000 people say we we feel passionate about this issue, will you please look at it? And they turn around and flat say, no, we're not doing it. Yeah. So I mean, is is democracy is not a thing. It's it's a, it's an ideal. You know, it's not a an actual thing that exists in 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 the world today, <laughs> anywhere. You know. So we we also fool ourselves. Uh, in 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 that way that we think that we're a democracy, so therefore we have a right to tell other people how to do their democracy, uh, and it's it's all a big farce, you know. It's all um, an illusion, you know. So that my the, the illusion that my vote counts, that somehow, you know, choosing whatever representative of oligarchy, you know, happens to be up there that's most um, appealing. Um, that that somehow gives me some power in this system, but it's really money that gives you power in the system. Yeah, and well, so this is the thing, isn't it? The, uh, the, the 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 time is money thing again. I, I I like the way we've kind of cycled back around to that time and money and 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 money is a kind of a, a thing which holds a, a massive importance in our lives, but in effect, it's a game. It's it's not real. And it affects us on every level, socially, politically, uh, how much we can eat, our social class, everything depends on this thing, which is, in effect, intangible. The value of a dollar or a pound is dependent on what two people agree its value is, um, the person who's giving it and the person who's receiving it. And we pin huge amounts of social importance on this thing, which is, in effect, just an, an, a concept it's just an idea it's just a, a means of exchange um, and I think we need to focus more on the value than the money and and seeing people vote for for people who are progressive as valuable as opposed to people who've got the most backing would be a, a quantum leap socially if, if people could put people in power who were who had integrity people with credibility people who told the truth people who didn't claim huge sums of money for speaking or 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 whatever they, they're getting involved in banking and law and uh, business wh- whatever facets of society their fingers have crept into as a means of control i think we need to kind of drag that back and look at you know which 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 of our representatives has the most integrity which of our representatives has the, the best vision where we're going which of us is is kind of looking to move social structures to to a more progressive state and not look at them in terms of you know who's going to bring my mortgage payment down who's going to make my my end of year you know bottom line better and and as a culture we need to kind of address that as opposed to leaving it to our representatives i think we need to take much more personal responsibility about the energy we're sending out there yeah absolutely um so it it is a hard question though between Okay, how do we best use the system that we have in place now and change it at the same time uh, yeah, into I, something better? I had, a, I had a dream one day where I managed to, to completely change the UK government. <laughs> this was my dream. I'd, I'd, I'd identified the top pivotal roles in, in all of government. And I said, right, these guys are the ones that are the movers and the shakers. If we can put someone in this role, it's going to affect a whole area of society. Over here, we call them permanent secretaries. They're, they're there no matter who you vote for. They're in already. They're there. And my goal was to to get as many of my people into those positions of power over the course of a generation. So I'd have like a team of 600 kids and I'd educate them to the roles that they were going to fill. And then they'd go and they'd take on these roles and then they would be able to change the entire system overnight because they'd all be ready to go. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> it was just a dream. And I woke up to the same 
same stuff that I went to sleep to, unfortunately. But yeah, it happens. We to, yeah, <laughs> we need to we need to get really creative on them because you know that there 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 is almost a malevolent force inside government. Um, in the UK, we we, um, we we have a conservative government at the minute, and they are really clamping down on on public spending, and then they're selling it off to private interests that they are in cahoots with almost. And it, it's it's something we're all aware of. Everybody in the UK knows this is going on, but we don't have the ability to to stop it. You know, we can protest, we can we can go on strike, we can do all this kind of stuff. Everybody knows that's the agenda, but we aren't given the political purchase. We aren't given the the, the traction that we need to stop it and prevent it from happening. Um, and I think that the, the challenge lies in finding the, the right angle to to kind of so that the least amount of effort causes the best and most effect in that area. Do you think protesting it works? Do you think it's it's a something that we should do to, to affect change? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, well, I, I, I've been on protests. I've done a bit of activism myself. I, I think that the numbers are important. It shows, you know, how many people are, are, are interested in the issue. Um, I've, I've witnessed how the press deal with protests. I, I've been at a protest where there was upwards of 5,000 people. And when I read about it, when I got home, there was only 300 people there. It was amazing. Like literally three, three and a half, four hundred thousand. Poof. Had vanished. Gone. <laughs> yeah, gone. And, and it's, it, it's a, a, a multifaceted thing. You know, you've got to have media. You've got to have people out there with cameras recording and posting it up online, live feeds and all this kind of stuff. And I think technology is driving that as well. We're looking at um, uh, emails, which, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are sending emails to their MP saying, over here in the UK saying, we want this issue addressed because it's important to us. Um, and groups are forming, you know, interest groups that are, that are more grassroots and not funded by political interests. Um, and that's that's having a, a, an effect over here. But um, I think we've got a lot further to go. And I think I think that protesting is evolving. It's changing in its nature, um, although it still exists in its current form. You know, you, there was a massive protest in Berlin the other day uh, against uh, like this, this uh, the the local equivalent of these TIPPs and, and you know, a lot of people um, are protesting on important issues and it is kind of um, important that people carry on protesting, I think, because, because you know, how else would we know about it if, um, if there weren't those people out there? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, it might not be for everyone, but I think where, wherever your, um, you know, your gifts lie, uh, non-compliance, yeah. creative non-compliance, uh, yeah, is, is that, a big that's one. Kind of my approach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> creative yeah. Non-compliance is a big thing. Um, <laughs> not spending money on. Yeah. And, and explaining, to, communicating to people why it's important, what you're what you're boycotting. Um, the uh, the word protest kind of legally means an appeal to authority, so it, it does kind of place the person you're protesting to in a kind of above you kind of sense and really the, the people have the power um but it's it's getting the, the right numbers and, and applying the force in the right way is our is our, our weapon we need to we need to kind of organize we need to kind of think what, what our end game is what, what the result that we want and, and get in touch with the people who are who are you know important in that whatever cause is whether it's medical marijuana whether it's um, you know kind of changing the political landscape I, th I think it's insane how many people are shot by police in America it's it's just absolutely insane um, and in in the UK it's not even a thing um, the, the police I think will shoot on average two or three people a year and often it's with a taser. Um, and often those people who die, it's it's through a complication, a heart problem or some of that. But very, very rarely will armed officers shoot actual live rounds. And it, it, it's a culture, you know, that we've developed over a, a period of time. And America could apply the same thing. They could they could apply the same kind of tactics of, of diffusing situations and approaching it in a constructive way. Um, and I, I guess that's their job anyway, to protect and serve. But obviously, you know, somewhere along the line, it got 
denatured quite considerably. So but. yeah, there's a huge uh, push by well, what I call the psychopaths in charge, you know, to uh, militarize the police, yeah. and it's been going on for a long time, and and slowly, you know, slowly over time, you know, people, young people, really don't don't see the they don't see it yet. It's like what they've always known. But, you know, David, when I was a David kid... Doesn't work for that, doesn't he? he calls it the, uh, the totalitarian tiptoe. Yeah, the, yeah. Like, the slow, incremental steps towards a, a very totalitarian kind mm-hmm. of setup. And, yeah. And militarizing the police uh, is, is not, not the way to go if you want to decrease violence in a, in a society or if you want to decrease criminality. It's a pound, well, a dollar for dollar, very ineffective strategy there are other ways to spend that money which would give a much better return in in terms of social value um and and a reduction in crime and violence and violent crime um arming the police does not bring down violent crime (laughs) thank you so much james houghton you've been a wonderful guest thanks kira i really enjoyed myself